Hi Raptor fans! Teresa here at the Montana Raptor Conservation Center in Bozeman, Montana. Thank you so much for watching our video today. I am so excited to talk about our very special raptor species that we're going to be covering today. This type of raptor, whenever I ask anybody what their favorite raptor is, nine times out of ten, they're going to say owls, which is what we're going to talk about today. There is so much information to cover about these birds that before we get out our owl raptor ambassadors for you to meet, I do want to cover a few important things about owl species, especially the ones we have here in Montana. Now in the uh, North America, we have about 20 species of owls and in Mon Montana, we are lucky enough to have 15 of those species, which is pretty amazing. That is a lot of different owls. Um, here we have snowy owls. Um, you're going to find more in the northern area in the wintertime, the snowy owls and the hawk owls. We also have great horned owls, barred owls, barn owls, we have burrowing owls, and we also have short-eared owls, long-eared owls. We have some really tiny ones like the flammulated owl, the uh, eastern screech owl, also the western screech owl, and also we have some really, really tiny ones like the boreal owl, sawwet owl, and the pygmy owl. I think we covered them all. Lots of amazing owl species here in Montana. Now, um, owls are really special for the environment, but also for uh, the history of many different cultures. Some cultures see owls as a protector. Some cultures do see them as a symbol of death, which if you are a mouse, they definitely could be a symbol of death. But all in all, they are very, very important to us and our environment. They are huge rodent hunters, and they cover the spectrum of hunting time that a lot of other raptor species do not. So most raptors are diurnal, meaning they hunt during the daytime. But owls are often crepuscular, means they hunt at dusk and dawn, and also, of course, nocturnal, meaning they hunt at night. And they are going to be covering a lot of those rodents and other animals that are going to be out and about at night. So definitely helpful for our rodent populations. Some animals actually breed so much in the wild that they were basically meant to be controlled, have their populations controlled by predators, which is really helpful for our owl species and definitely important for us and our environment. Now, um, owls are so good at hunting rodents that some, some owls, like the barn owls, actually uh, a pair of barn owls and their young will he eat on the upwards about 4,000 rodents in just one year. So definitely really, really important to have these owl species around here controlling our rodent populations. Owls are, they have the characteristics that most raptors have, like very large eyes, hooked sharp talons with strong feet, and they also have uh, a hooked upper beak. So three of those characteristics you can see on most raptors, but they have so many other amazing adaptations. And before we meet our first owl guest, I did wanna cover something with one of our props about owl's eyes. Owls have insanely huge eyes. And I have a owl skull for you all to see here. And I hope you can see it, but look at how big those eye sockets are in order to hold an owl's eyes. Their eyes are so big, they take up two thirds of the space inside of their skull. And they actually make up 3% of an owl's body weight. A human's eyes make up about three ten thousandths of our body weight, which is 0.003%. So definitely a little bit smaller. And our eyesight, of course, is not quite as important to us as a great, uh, great horned owl eyes or any other owl's eyes species. Uh, owl eyes are actually more of a tube shape or like a, like a light bulb shape than they are a sphere. So that's something that makes them really unique too. And um, if you can see on this skull right here, they have what's called sclerotic rings. Those are bony rings that help to hold their eyes in place and also um, protect them as well. Now you can kind of see the shape of the outside is quite a bit smaller right here compared to the inside. So you can kind of see how that would be 
a light bulb shaped eye and that's really important for them for letting in a whole lot of light and keeping their vision up at night but it also makes their eyes stuck straight in their skull which is pretty uh, pretty hard for them to turn their eyes right so they, they can't turn their eyes around and what they do instead is they're gonna pivot their head now that we have seen that owl skull up close and personal um, I'm going to go ahead and get our first owl raptor ambassador for you all to meet and we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about their eyes which is a really important characteristic for them all right hi we have our first raptor ambassador for you all to meet this here is boo and i'm going to give you all just a little bit of time to get a good look at him before i tell you what species of raptor he is now you might already know that he is a type of owl of course we're talking about owls but he has a lot of different things on his face and in his body that are going to give you clues that he is an owl now his species of owl is the great horned owl and you can see kind of where they get their name from on those things sticking out the top of his head but of course you can kind of see especially when he turns his head those are not horns and a lot of people even when they're looking close up with this bird can think maybe it's a those are ears because they do kind of look like cat ears or horse ears but as he turns his head you can get a really good look and see that those are actually just tufts of feathers so those feathers are called plumicorns which I remember that word because it's plumage and unicorn squished together so they look kind of like a horn and kind of like ears but they actually are just feathers and they might help him blend in a little bit. They might help him with his camouflage. They might also help him to communicate with other animals. <laughs> Who's gonna talk about it for a little bit there? So if, if he sees another great horned owl, those tufts will often go straight up in the air showing that he's very alert and maybe telling that other owl to leave his area. Oftentimes before he's about to fly off, his tufts will go flat against his head and that might make him a little more aerodynamic um, but that also might be how he shows that he is a little uncomfortable now sometimes we can see his tufts and use them as a good way to tell how comfortable boo is in a situation so that can be very useful but not all owl species have those plumicorns so sometimes you're gonna have to read other types of body language from owls to see how their how their comfort level is now, of course, the first thing people notice about Boo here are his gigantic yellow eyes, which you cannot see right now. Okay, there we go. <laughs> They're huge, right? Remember that owl skull? His eyes are so big. They take up two thirds of the space inside of his skull. Now, not only are they massive, but they're also very, very particularly designed for when this owl is going to be hunting. Great horned owl hunt are Great horned owls typically hunt at night, so they are nocturnal, but they also will be found hunting at dusk and dawn, so they are also crepuscular. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is the placement of his eyes. You can see that they are on the very front of his face and forward facing, like most predators, and they have a field of view of 110 degrees, and 64% of that is binocular vision. Now, binocular vision is going to really help them with good depth perception and binocular vision is the percentage of your eyesight that overlaps so your left eye and your right eye overlap and that's what's going to help you with depth perception humans have a 180 field degrees field of view and then a hundred and thirty three degrees of that is binocular vision which is 54 percent of that and hawks have a hundred and fifty degree field of view but only about 40 to 50 percent of that is binocular vision and that's 33 percent of their vision so owls forward facing eyes on the very front of their face is going to definitely help them out with their depth perception their eye structure is also very different from other even other raptors first of all owls eyes are extremely dominated by densely packed retinal rods all animals have eyes uh, all animals' eyes have photoreceptors shaped like cones and rods. Retinal co cones function best in bright light and they help 
to see uh, color, so color vision. Rods are much more sensitive in low light situations, are gonna be work best in dim lighting. Owls have almost a million rods per square millimeter in their eyes, whereas humans have about 200,000 rods per square millimeter in their eyes. So you can definitely see why owls would have excellent night vision. <laughs> now you can see that Boo here is turning his head quite a bit. Oftentimes when we're outside, there are some other predator birds that might fly overhead or just any birds in general. Boo's really good at keeping an eye out for them. And you can see him turning his head very quickly and very easily. That's something that's extremely important for owls. Their eyes being so big and light bulb shaped, they're not able to move their eyes around in their sockets. So they instead have to turn their head. Now, uh, humans have what we call cervical vertebrae in our necks. Animals have cervical vertebrae also, but humans and other mammals typically have seven vertebrae in our necks whereas owls have 14 vertebrae in their necks. Also, their spinal column up on their necks is a little bit more of an S shape, and their spinal or their cervical vertebrae is actually a quite a bit smaller, and that's gonna allow them to be a bit more flexible when they're turning their necks. Now you can see Boo's a little bit warm. We've got some extra warm weather today, which is why we're sitting in the shade, so hopefully that will keep him cool. But birds don't actually have the ability to sweat. So just like your dog, if it gets hot, they will pant to help cool down. So he's a little bit warm. <laughs> Do you need a break? We'll see, we'll see if he gets a little hotter in a, later on. Now we can turn our heads 90 degrees of a circle in one direction. So starting at the front, 90 degrees this way and 90 degrees this way. But owls can turn their heads 270 degrees one way. So Boo can look over his shoulder, over his back, oh, very good, thank you, all the way to his other shoulder before he has to turn his neck back around the other way. Now, if you look at Boo, take a good look at his feathers on his back and on his chest, you can probably tell exactly where he would likely live in the wild. These birds often can be found in forests and they blend in exceptionally well with trees. Now they are very adaptable, which means they can live in many different environments. You can even find these birds somewhere in the desert or in marshlands. So they're definitely good at adapting to different environments. They can even be found near people. We actually have great horned owls that nest on campus here in Bozeman, and a lot of nesting pairs can be found in the middle of town, hunting for mice over an open field like a, a soccer field or something like that. So they are really, really adaptable, probably one, likely going to be one of the owls that you will see in the wild. A good way to tell that you are around a great horned owl is that hoot. They go, who's up late? Me too, that's the pattern. They don't typically say those words, right? But the pattern is, who's up late? Me too. It goes, hoo, 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 hoo. So if you've ever heard that before, you have been around a great horned owl, which is pretty cool. Now in a little bit, we will be talking about how specialized owl's feet are. And I want you to take a good look at Boo's feet. You can see he's got two toes in front and two toes in back right now. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Boo here is a pretty amazing raptor ambassador. He is 21 years old this year, and we are so, so lucky to have him as a raptor ambassador. If you have any questions about Boo or there's anything else you would like to learn about owls, please feel free to comment down in the comment section below. Now we're gonna take a little break from meeting our owl raptor ambassadors and talk a little bit more about some really specific characteristics that they have. <clears throat> we're gonna use our talon board to show you all some owl feet up close. Now, not all of these are owl feet. You can see here's an osprey right here. But here is a snowy owl foot, a great horned owl foot, <clears throat> a long-eared owl foot, and a northern saw wet owl foot. One thing you might notice is that they all are very covered in feathers. They have feathers all the way down to their talons. You might notice that here, the snowy owl foot actually has feathers all the way going underneath their foot. And uh, it's definitely a little bit more covered 
than the other owl species. You might also notice the osprey foot has no feathers. Owl species actually typically do not migrate. There are some that will migrate based on food availability, especially birds like the flammulated owl that highly rely on eating insects and would not get many of those insects here in Montana in the winter time. So they will migrate based on food availability. Sometimes we will have snowy owls here in Montana in the winter time if their food availability is a lot less up in the Arctic. So that's typically when you'll see them shift around based on migration. Now another thing you might notice, they all have very nice curved talons, but the arrangement of their toes is a little bit different than other raptors. Osprey and owls all have this toe right here on the outside that actually can shift from the front of their foot to the back of their foot. Right now most of them kind of have it in a middle area, but they can shift their toe all the way to the back and have a zygodactyl toe arrangement where these two are in front and these two are in back, or they can shift it more to the front and have an isodactyl toe arrangement. And the isodactyl toe arrangement is going to be really useful for killing their prey. So it'll give that back talon a lot of extra pressure. It's called the hallux talon. And that will allow them to get a much easier kill grab. Whereas when they're perched, the two toes in front and two toes in back arrangement is going to be very helpful for them to perch and stay nice and stable and steady. Whereas if you see other raptor feet like the red rough-legged hawk right here or the prairie falcon even the turkey vulture they all have isodactyl toe arrangements so the owls and the osprey are a little specially built in that way very very helpful for them all right everybody here is our other raptor owl ambassador that we're going to meet here today this is prairie and a lot of people don't often see this species of owl in the wild. They're not as adaptable as great horn owls, so they don't typically live near a lot of people, higher populations of people. She does kind of have those feather tufts like Boo, but they're very tiny, and right now hers are barely sticking up. A lot of times when you see this owl species in the wild, you won't usually see those feather tufts. She'll usually put them up if a, another predator flies by or another bird flies too close. Now, I, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of time to guess what kind of owl species she is. She's what's called a short-eared owl. And like we talked about with Boo, those little tufts are not ears, but that is how she gets her name. So short-eared owls often don't have their feather tufts up, so their name doesn't really help out with IDing quite as much. Now, you can look at her belly and see quite a different coloration than we saw with Boo earlier. Now, Boo has that beautiful coloration for living in the forest. He has excellent camouflage up against a tree, and he has some of that white that will help him blend into snow. But with Prairie here, she's not quite tree colored. I'm going to let you see her back a little bit. She does have some modeled modeling on her back, but she mostly has those... Um, vertical stripes on her belly and those are going to really help her blend in to grass. These birds are ground nesters and they're often found in large open fields and their camouflage is going to really help them blend into the grass or the base of a tree. So since they do nest on the ground they are very hard to spot. If you do see them odds are you'll see them perched on a fence post on the side of the road. That's kind of the easiest way to see them. Now she is an exceptionally gorgeous bird and we are so lucky to have her here at the Raptor Center. A lot of people notice she has dark around her eyes and that's another pretty unique feature about short-eared owls. They have almost what looks like mascara around their eyes so they're extra beautiful. But you can also get a good look at the round shape of her face. That's another good way to tell you're looking at an owl. Owls have what's called a facial disc, and that is made up of thick, bristly feathers, and it helps to funnel sound back to their ears. Now, I know we talked about those feather tufts not being ears, but she still has ears. They're just hidden. They're not visible to us like our ears are. So they're right at the edge of that facial disc, one on either side, and she has, and owls have what's called 
asymmetrical hearing. So a lot of owl species have one that ear that's down here and one ear that's up here. And what that does is it allows them to triangulate exactly where sound is coming from. So a lot of owls, like great gray owls, they have huge facial discs and that's gonna help them funnel a lot of sound back to their ears. Some great gray owls can find mice underneath a layer of snow. There's some pretty cool videos online if you ever wanna check it out of great gray owls diving their feet below the snow and coming up with a mouse. There's no way they saw that, they just heard it. So, so cool. Oh, Prairie's nice and chatty today. Now, it would be kind of, their facial disc is kind of like if we took our hand and put it behind our ears like this, that's gonna help funnel more sound to our ears. So if you do that right now, you can probably hear a few more sounds than you were able to hear before you did that. And then when you take your hand away, you can hear those sounds a little less easily. Also, my voice might sound a little bit louder when you do that too. So that's kind of a good way to get an idea of how the facial disc works. Now their ears, even though they're hidden, they are pretty large. Um, especially short-eared owls, their ears are kind of like slits in the side of their head, but they're very, very long, a lot bigger than you would expect them to be. But that's going to be really helpful for this bird. Hearing is extremely helpful. Now you can also get a good look at her facial disc, the feathers on near her beak. Those are extremely important for actually helping her with her sight, which seems kind of strange, but I don't know if you can see them kind of sticking out away from the front of her beak when she turns her, set her head sideways. Oh, excellent job, Prairie. Those are gonna help her feel her prey when she has them in her feet. So owls have that amazing vision we were talking about with Boo, where they can see prey a long distance away, but they are far sighted. So they can see really well a long ways away, but up close, they have very poor vision. So what they do is when they have prey in their feet, they'll use those feathers to feel where their prey is and that will allow them to tell where their prey is without seeing them very well. Oh, there we go. Now that's kind of a strange noise, right? Something that's pretty cool about owls is that they all have different sounds. And when prairie is extra com comfortable, she often makes that little chirping call. And if you hear certain owl sounds at night, be sure to look them up online and see if you can match them to any owl sounds that you hear online. And that will help you know what type of owl species you are hearing. Not all owls hoot. They also do have different types of sound, like that, that sound right there that she makes when she's a little bit more comfortable. It's kind of like a food call that babies will make when they're younger to their parents for food. Prairie is what's called an imprint. When she was little, her parents actually um, were run over since they were on the ground and they passed away. But the baby survived and since she was fed by people at a very, very young age, she now does not have the ability to survive in the wild. So she's lost her ability to hunt. She is very, very comfortable with people and uh, she would not survive on her own. So she still kind of makes that little baby call sound to us. And she also, when their hoot, their song that they typically do, it actually kind of sounds like a bark. I can't mimic it at all. It sounds terrible when I do it, but make sure to look it up. It's a pretty unique sound. Now, another thing that's pretty amazing with owls is that they're excellent predators. Even a little girl like Prairie here would be an excellent predator. They have those strong feet with those sharp talons, and then that hooked upper beak helps them to rip their food into bite-sized pieces. But they're also basically ninjas. Owls have almost completely silent flight. So if Prairie is trying to sneak up on her prey, which is mostly voles, they eat a lot of mice and voles, which have excellent hearing. So she wants to be nice and stealthy when she is looking for her prey. Owls have fringe or frimbria or fluting on the edges of their feathers that allows them to flap their wings and make little to no noise whatsoever. Now all these soft fringed feathers are obviously going to help her stay nice and quiet, but she is now less uh, 
less water resistant. So if it rains in prairie, it gets soaked, she's not gonna be able to fly. Sometimes we'll actually get owls after a really big rainstorm into the raptor center, and all they needed was a little bit of time to dry off. And it can be pretty hard to be a, a non-flighted owl stuck on the ground. It's easy for predators to catch them. So it is often nice that they have a nice safe place to sleep and dry off. And then once they're nice and dry, we will release them back into the wild. But some birds that have more more stiff feathers that aren't as quiet. They have a lot more uh, waterproofing on their feathers. Their feathers are more tightly bound. They don't have any of that fringe that is going to let feathers in. And you can see Prairie here. Her feet have a little bit of fluff on them, so that will help to keep her warm in the winter. You're not often going to see a lot of short-eared owls around Bozeman, but we do have quite a few that you can see over by Big Timber and over by Billings. And if you're ever driving through those areas near an open field, keep an eye out for these amazing species of birds. She's a pretty fantastic bird. We're really, really lucky to have her. If you have any questions about prairie or boo, please feel free to put them in the comments below. Now we are going to do a demonstration about a silent flight that owls do. So as we talked about with prairie, owls have extremely silent flight. And a really uh, important way that they achieve this is through fluting or fringing of their feathers, especially on the edge of their wings. You might be able to see this um, up close a little bit, but the edge of their feathers has a fringe. Kind of looks like eyelashes. And that's what's going to really help them to minimize their turbulence when they flap their wings. So they create what's called micro turbulence with these tiny little eyelash like fringe at the edge of their feathers. Also, their feathers are very soft. The tops of them have a little bit of that fringing as well, and it makes them very soft to the touch. Now, here I have a turkey vulture feather, and turkey vultures do not need to be stealthy. They uh, are not sneaking up on their prey, right? Their prey is usually already dead before they're eating it. So they have very stiff feathers, and I don't know if you can see, but the edges right here are very flat, and even just touching it, you can hear it makes a little bit of a sound. So I'm gonna go ahead and flap this feather really quick for you and see if you can hear anything. All right, so that was that turkey vulture feather. Now I'm going to flap this whole great horn owl wing. All right, see if you can hear anything with this. Very quiet, you might have heard some other things move from the wind of this, but owls have almost completely silent flight, which is not only helpful for them to sneak up on their prey, mice and rats and uh, rabbits all have excellent hearing, so owls definitely want to be stealthy, but it also allows owls to hear better. So if they're flying around like a turkey vulture or a bald eagle and they're trying to hear their prey, they're not going to be able to hear anything over the flapping of their wings. If, I don't know if you've ever had a bald eagle flap over your head, but they sound like a giant flying trash bag. They are not stealthy at all. But um, if you have an owl fly over your head, sometimes people don't even know that it flew over the top of them because they're so, so silent. Such an amazing adaptation. Now, I hope that you learned a million things about owls today, but the most important thing, of course, is that these birds are extremely important to our environment. And everybody out there can do little things every single day that help out owls and our environment in a huge way. A lot of uh, people right now are actually trying to poison rodents that live in their yard or in their fields to, um, to help keep those populations down. But owls can actually eat a rodent that's been poisoned and get secondary poisoning. So they can get poisoned by that original rodent eating mouse poison or rodent poison. So if you have uh, rodent problems in your yard or in your house, make sure to use uh, non-secondary poison or snap traps or have a heart traps that are live traps. And those can really make a huge difference in um, our owls out there in the wild. And anything you can do to help these birds out makes a big difference in our owl populations in the wild. So thank you so much for listening. The more you know about animals, the more you can do to help them. So you've already done a lot to help out these birds. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.
Bye! Now I wanted to save this for the end of our video in case we have some squeamish viewers. Um, these birds do eat rodents in the wild and when we work with raptors we use positive reinforcement in order to uh, gain get their confidence up on the glove and in front of people so when prairie is in programs or doing something <clears throat> like traveling in a crate something that she might not be as comfortable with we will reward her with little bits of mice as positive reinforcement so if you are not comfortable viewing little pieces of mice do not watch this next part but i'm going to give prairie a couple of snacks she's very excited about it Meow. <laughs> now she is actually um, built to swallow a vole right down the hatch but I'm giving her little pieces of mice to make it oh that's two pieces oh no that's one piece okay little pieces of mice to make it a little easier for her to swallow but I want to make sure that she gets nice positive reinforcement for sitting in front of the camera even though the camera might seem a little less scary to us than sitting in front of a bunch of people might be. For birds, they're not used to cameras up in their face. So she is definitely doing excellent hanging out in front of the video. Oh, here's a nice tasty gut piece. She's pretty picky. Sometimes she actually doesn't want to eat the ones with the guts in it. <laughs> the guts are actually very important for raptors to ingest. They act, don't typically drink lots of water out of the bowl. Instead, they get most of their water intake from their food. Do you want this one instead? Want that piece? Yeah. So they're actually going to get most of their water intake from eating the, the guts, the liver, and the heart of the animal. Oh, but Prairie is a pretty picky eater. So sometimes she doesn't, she doesn't want to eat it or she takes her, her sweet, sweet time while she eats it. Now I hope that you were able to enjoy this video and you learned a lot about owls. And I thank you so much. I hope that this last part didn't gross you out too much. Have a great rest of your day. See ya.